Okay, so we are now into chapter five uh, of the book Beyond Belief by Elaine Pagels, and we're dealing with Constantine and the Catholic Church. Um, but I'm not going to talk about Con Constantine at all. Okay. Uh, we're going to save it for, I think, Paul Jesus next Sunday and let him cover the, the second half of the chapter that deals with Constantine and the, the establishment of that of a state church. So, we're going to start with a couple of questions. She starts this chapter with kind of a personal reminiscence um, and uh, says, in part, besides belief, Christianity involves practice and paths towards transformation. Any reactions to that? Is that what Christianity is for you? Say it again. Oh, yeah, I believe. Yeah, it involves practice and practice. Practice and so basically she's saying it's practice, belief, and the path towards transformation. Does that sound like our I belief think, in Christianity? I think so. It's true. Yeah. No disagreements? Mm -hmm. No. Oh. I mean, belief is good. It's a starting point. Okay. But it's without the practice. It's like a doctor who's never practiced medicine but has studied all the books, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily want to be his first patient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You too. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 How to take out an appendix. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, YouTube works for some things. <laughs> Maybe not surgery. Uh, uh, Pagel's daughter, I think, recount when she was eight years old, she joined uh, the church choir, and her response was, the reason was that the music melts my heart. How do you all feel about that? I agree with that. It helps my heart. Me too. Sometimes more than the spoken word. Yeah. Yeah. And music and movie tears, and sometimes the spoken word doesn't. <laughs> so. Any other comments on, on that uh, phrase? Music often is the spoken word. Yeah. Yeah. That's true too. Okay, well, she goes a step further. And in that opening, she says, New Testament scholars, knowing that we have little or no historical information about Jesus' birth, they regard the story as a mixture of legend and midrash, that is storytelling that draws upon Israel's stories. So, how about that? Yes, no, maybe? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. I'm open to that possibility. Um, it's hard to um, give up cherished. I, I think the story of the nativity, whether you're a, whether you're a, more on the skeptical side or the true believer side, it's hard to give up the the nativity story. It's just so cherished. Yeah, it is. Um, I would like to think that it's mostly true, but it's kind of like, well, who was, who was the historian back then yeah. that documented it? So. Yeah. And there, other than the Gospels themselves, there's very little, Josephus mentions uh, Jesus, but beyond that, there's very little historical documentation. Again, besides the, the Gospel. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the Nativity story, and she talks about Attending to the sounds of the silence, the candlelight and darkness, I felt the celebration take us in, in and break over us like the sea. When it receded, it left me no longer clean to particular moments of the past, but borne upon waves of love and gratitude towards Sarah, the daughter, toward the whole community gathered there at home or everywhere, the dead and the living. But she's experiencing 
kind of an emotional reaction, and this is to the story of the Nativity scene, Christmas Eve series. Anyone ever felt that? Maybe not at the Nativity, but yes, I have felt. Sometimes here at church, just being able to. I imagine that the death of her son stayed with her and maybe crippled her emotionally for years and years. And maybe this was something that helped her come to the final where she could take it all in. Okay. Have any of you ever experienced kind of tiffany or moment of spiritual insight? Church can. Well, I'm I'm leading up to you're a little too fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leading up to uh, through the music or through uh, how about the Good Friday service yeah, or the Christmas Eve service or the Christmas Day service when the music the choir provides and the bell choir provides and, and the organ. Have you ever felt that spoke to you more than more than the scriptures perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. Give me an example. <coughs> or you just want to go with yes. Well, I think somehow the music reaches parts of my brain that is able to open me up. So consider that you're part of the choir, so you're part of some of the Yes, well, but even sitting in the congregation, when I when I first came, I was in the congregation okay. and not part of it. Do, do you not feel that as part of the choir? Yeah. That is no, 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 over yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think part of what uh, Pagels is driving toward here is the concept of scripture versus personal emotional experience. Yeah. And whether that brings us, can bring us to, to God as much as, or to Christianity as much as, studying the scriptures. Well, I think sometimes more so because you're in the moment and you're surrounded by people and you know you get it multi-sensory mm. rather than when you're just reading the scripture it's just you and the scripture and God mm -hmm. and so sometimes the culmination of all the, the different parts you know become a, a larger whole right so like it's interesting because uh, some people grow up in the church they're steeped in scripture and it's just kind of in, it's in the air. And then you have people that are come into the church and this is all new to them. Now, sometimes new converts have a certain zeal to them that exceeds that of the um, old timers. But uh, uh, it, there is a, a subjective experience for sure. Um, I guess the only danger with that is that you don't want to raise up that personal experience too high. It becomes an idol. But scripture can also be an idol. So. Well, I, uh, I think we have, this is we have different learning styles. Like we have different worship styles. And for me, the music has always been a very in integral part of worship. And, and which is not to say that some messages have not so, so let's uh, take a step forward. And uh, Irenaeus, <laughs> our dear friend, says if spiritual understanding may arise from human experience, what we were just talking about, doesn't this mean that there's nothing but human invention and therefore false? Hmm. I'll say here a name. It's not one of my favorite people. <laughs> um, I'm 
mean, yes, you can be led in the wrong direction, but I think if there's no personal experience, then I don't think you're wrong. Other comments? What kind of experience would be not <laughs> Well, I think he means just listening to what the preacher has to say and then go along your merry way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even that is a human experience, truly. Yeah. Right. Well, revelation is humans encountering God and filtering it through their perception. You know, we cannot experience God in totality we would be vaporized, you know, so, or our minds would be blown, or it wouldn't. So, yeah, I think, I think, I think he um, is closing the gate just a little more too narrowly for most of us, but I, I see some wisdom in that. It's why, just, why do you think he's trying to close the gate? Of what we study now, why do you think he's trying to close the gate? Because he wants us to listen to him and nobody else. That, that's true too, but it's it, it just seems like it was the Wild West back then in the first century. <laughs> it was okay. theologically, it was the Wild West. It was just that's, that's, a, that's a good uh, example, actually. <laughs> yeah. And you know, when you're getting rounded up and killed and and dissent was not tolerated. Of well, course, he kind of became tyrannical too, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, it goes on to say, do we mistake our own projections for the theology? Each one seeks to validate his own experience. Sometimes. Any examples? Or that kind of hard to think. Well, the human nature is always looking for validation. Uh, whether it's just having somebody tell you, you know, you did something good, or you, you know, giving you a pat on the back. You, know, it's human nature nature to crave. That. Okay. So I, I can see a little bit of that in there, um, and we can only understand things through our unique journey, uh, what has happened in the past affects everything, you know, in one way or another, and so we do project our own understanding on everything that we see and hear and do. Yeah, I think that's that's a good summary. We are all, uh, well, seen through a glass darkly. I mean, they're all biased by our own past experiences. And again, you have to remember that Irenaeus is, is at a time when what we later call Gnostics are all coming up with their own experiences, saying, this is what Christianity is, this is what Christianity is, this is what Christianity is. And, and Irenaeus is saying, no, it's only based on what he calls the four form gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So he's trying to bring some kind of unity back to this, literally create the universal church, which... John, John. Yes. I don't know what that was. Oh, that was me joining, and I'm trying to unmute. Mom and I are going to listen. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I thought it was the voice of God for a second, <laughs> especially since it was female. <laughs> it, it could be the voice of God. <laughs> Feel free to interrupt any time. So, you... Irenaeus is trying to create this universal church, which we call the Catholic Church, small c Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's trying to limit how 
Jim Needham views the scriptures and interprets them, and how John O'Neill does, and how Arlene Leonard does. He's trying to say, if it's not in the four gospels, it's not part of Christianity. So that's that's what he's why he's downplaying personal experience. Because they had all sorts of individuals prophesying, interpreting, uh, both priest and non priest basically saying this is what Christianity is. And he was trying to stabilize or standardize. Hey Jonathan? Yes. Since he thinks everybody else's ideas are subject to being false, how come he never question might be his or well that's uh, <laughs> that that may be the biggest question of all um, because when we all of us when we grasp onto something that we think is is correct it's really hard to shake us mm -hmm. so uh, I'm not sure Irenaeus didn't at some point have some self-reflection but as the result of it was he thought that these four Gospels had to be the basis for, for Christianity. Um, and so the question is, and we've kind of answered it already, do we believe in Irenaeus that, as I, Irenaeus did, that whatever we might say about our own experience has nothing to do with God? Well, not everything that we experience may have something to do with God, but to look at it from <clears throat> Irenaeus's point of view, if you just leave it to the four Gospels, where is the personal growth then? And, well, he doesn't like to look beyond the basic words, so yeah. Yeah. I just don't see how you can grow personally without relating your own well it sounds like he doesn't believe people should talk should actually talk to god they should go through him or somebody he and agrees priest. with yeah yeah and, priest. and only the rightly practicing priest priests, yes yeah. well where does that put the four got four form gospel then i mean those were all written by human beings but they they were all people who knew jesus supposedly that's supposed that's to the only they're thing. still humans though. Yeah, that's true. Well, but, we can find lots of faults with him. <laughs> but back then they believed that God gave them the word, therefore it couldn't be wrong. Yeah. yeah. May I make a comment, please? Sure. I'd appreciate it. Sure. If I could say something. Um in Second Timothy, Paul says that all scripture is inspired by God for Reproof and instruction and all. You know where it's at in Second Timothy. And uh, so, you know, I I read every, I read the whole book and all of that. And the author had a PhD and she went in and did all this research and whatever. But uh, you, all of you need to remember, I was raised in Mapleton, Kansas, with the church down there. And my grandfather built. I can't help it. I have a conservative point of view. And I believe the Bible is true. And that's it. I believe it. Whatever is in the Bible now is inspired by God and is true. And if we have some problems with some of the scripture, that's not God's problem. But according but Irenaeus wouldn't have believed in Second Timothy. Well, I'll make my comment, okay. and I'm not going to change because... That's fine, I'm not I, trying to change you know. it. And I, I don't think that's too far, your comment's not that far off from what the rest of us believe either. Uh, the, the thing is, we're all heretics in this church. Because... So well, I know everybody has different views, but I just want people to understand my view. Oh, sure. That's fine. Well, my, my point is only that Joseph Smith was a heretic, as far as uh, Irenaeus was concerned, because he believed in continuing revelation. And Irenaeus would not agree with that. He'd say, it's not in the four Gospels. It's not spiritual. It's not Christianity. So in a sense, every one of us is, is a heretic in this church. That doesn't mean we don't believe in the Bible and the message of the Bible. 
It just means that we have, well, as Bill Smith would say, more like truth. And that's part of, I think that's part of your Mapleton upbringing too. The danger is if, if young people, like in uh, senior high, uh, Sunday school class, this might really rock their faith if they were taught what's in this book. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes. They might abandon the traditional values that they grew up with and say, oh, they might take it the wrong way and, and they might, you know, become a lot more liberal in their theology and it, it would hurt their faith in God. Oh, is it really true? Did, is it really inspired? And they ask a whole bunch of questions. You well, know, there, I think there's a time to go place. back to Second yes. Timothy and sure. see what Paul said about it. Well, I think there's a time and place for challenging people's beliefs, adding additional historical information. Um, I don't think we can avoid it because if a, a young person goes into college or even high school and has a religion course, they're going to they're going to talk about the historical basis for Christianity. And people are going to be challenged. But part of it is you need to be prepared and understand what you believe, what you truly believe, and, and what you don't. And sorry, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I, I think that Irenaeus is simply saying to us, he believes in, in a very strict interpretation which would exclude um, the letters of Paul, would exclude Latter-day Saint Revelation, and we can choose to follow that path or not. Um, so let's take a look at the next step here. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend time on this other than to say that Irony is, is saying that uh, it's the, the human, human beings keep all this stuff on, and they say, they look for something worthy of praise. They look at uh, human emotions, they look at mental exercises, they look at uh, commitment to a course of action, all all these words he puts forth, and what's in square brackets are my interpretation of the phrase in, in bold. And he said, they, so they ascribe the things that happen to human beings in whatever they recognize themselves as experiencing uh, to the divine word. And I think we would all agree that that's not universally true, but that's also not universally false that each person needs to evaluate the experiences they have individually and figure out what is true and what is not. I mean, ultimately, that's where we're at. Even Irenaeus had to determine what he believed to be true and what he believed to be false. I don't quite understand that when it says they have lied with no possibility at all against God. He's, he's again, uh, this is against heresies in the book. His throat, and he's again attacking the, the Gnostics and saying that they have lied <laughs> uh, in, in taking their human experiences and trying to say that they represent God and the, the, the be part of the truth. Well, then why did, if that were true, then why did Jesus use so many uh, parables? to teach many of his lessons because that was how he connected with the human spirit is through these parables that they sure. could understand the world. Sure. Sure. And so he's saying that that, that wasn't, you know, Jesus' would, words wouldn't they have anything to do with God here. What, what he's really saying is that the priest who is living rightly, a Christian life rightly, is the one who interprets, not the folks sitting around this table. Okay. And if you think about Catholicism back in the 50s and 60s, uh, there, it was pretty much a matter that you didn't read the Bible yourself. The priest told you through catechism what the meaning was, and you accepted it. There was not, I can't speak to it today. I, my wife was Catholic. She's described to me going through those early years and the process. I can't address what it's like today. But they never sat around a table like this and discussed the meaning of the parables. 
And in fact, if you did, you got your nuts wrapped. You so you don't ask those questions. You just sit there. So I think that's a natural uh, result of Irenaeus and his trying to combine things and keep it pretty much standard. Tidy. Yeah, keeping it tidy. Yeah, good way to put it. Well, the Catholics, I don't know if that's... My understanding is from my ex-daughter-in-law, and she told us, and she was Catholic, or had, had been raised Catholic, and, and she was saying that even if when she goes into another church and listens, that that's something she needs to go to confession about, because that's a sin. And even if she goes to another church when somebody's getting married or having a funeral, that's, you know, a sin for her would be a sin. Yeah. A sin. yeah. And I, I heard the same sorts of things from my wife, but we were getting married and all that sort of thing. So, um, I, th I think the Catholic, well, I'm not an authority on the Catholic Church, but I am a great admirer and I've been studying up on it and I think a lot of things changed after the Vatican II Council, and some things were for the better, I would say, and they seem to be more invested in learning scripture with the laity. Um, there are some other things that I don't think have been good, but I'm an outsider. Um, but yeah, whenever, I, I'm not big on micromanaging, you know, the flock, so to speak. Uh, I think you you should keep people in line to some extent, but yeah, micromanaging never never ends well. No, it ends up in a lot of reflection. Uh, Was that your experience growing up? You know, I think like in any group of people, there's everybody has different angles. I think it's today. Even oh, though I they're all going to the same place and looking at the same people, they're all following different angles. Regardless of well, and I was, you know, you were saying that yes, Irenaeus wanted it all tidy. Well, life isn't tidy. Well, I, my bringing up the Catholic Church of the fifties is simply a way of saying that I think that's a natural progression from Irenaeus. Yeah. And, but I, I know that uh, there have been changes in the church. Yeah. I know that they have become more open, especially in the more recent hope. So, like every organization, there is some some growth and change. But well, and I was going to say that current hope is from Central or South America? Originally, yeah. So, I was wondering how much maybe he was into liberation theology. Could be, and yet he is also facing some resistance. Many of the, uh, the movements he yeah. also. Well, again, from Irenaeus, is the coming of the Lord unnecessary and useless if indeed he did come intending to tolerate and preserve each person's ideas concerning God? In other words, do we even need the Lord if, in fact, we're going to be think, believing all over the place. And I think the answer is all self-evident that we would not agree that we would not agree that uh, Jesus coming was unnecessary, yeah. despite the fact that we may have a variety of opinions on, on Christianity mm -hmm. and what what is teaching. Now, now this I think resonates with me quite a bit. Um, like I said, I don't, I think Irenaeus goes too far in his boundary making, but um, this can be a real danger when, when you have a godless religion, or I should say, you exalt your, your view of God as, and I guess Irenaeus was, is just as susceptible, but I, um, can we, is he talking about Jesus here or, or God? He's, he's, talking, just, he's talking about Jesus, the coming of the Lord or Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's saying that if the intent was to tolerate and preserve every every person's ideas, then why did Jesus come? 
Well, maybe because each, well, maybe not all people, but a lot of people have a piece. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the whole thing is too big for our imagination. But we can imagine God, so. You know, but, not every person, but I would say a lot of people may have a piece of their own understanding of God. I don't know, I'm not saying well. Well, since the New Testament <clears throat> is the teachings of God, is all based on the teachings of God, then, I mean of Jesus, then he's basically saying to me in this statement, that he doesn't really believe in the New Testament, that everything is taken care of in the Old Testament. No, I think it's just the reverse. I, I think he's saying that uh, the coming of the Lord, of Jesus, wasn't necessary, but that it precludes every person having their own personal experience with God and coming up with their own ideas about what God and spirituality is. That's what irony is saying. Well, I guess the the unnecessary and the useless part of that sentence yeah. seems like backwards to me. I think, like we said at the beginning, with Gnosticism, and I'm not sure how exclusive the Gnostic schools are. Like, if they, if the Gnostics believed it was my way or the highway, that would be interesting to know. But um, it sounds like there was a fracturing, and everybody was kind of doing whatever fancied their spirituality or beliefs. And so you have um, Christianity um, is all what I feel. And um, so then you have thousands of different Christianities. But that's unworkable. Well, we do. <laughs> yeah. Look at all the denominations out there. Yeah. Well, some would argue, and I'm not sure how I feel about that, but some would argue that that's a, a sad thing, that we are so divided, that we're not unified. Uh, now, do you know why that is? That we're so divided? Yeah. you know why that is? So, well, the, I mean, think about it. Everybody, you know, if everybody was in one church, so the human condition is to, part of it is to survive and advance, you know, make money. I think okay. a lot of these churches are in it for the dollars. But it's, you know, every, every split up, there's people following certain people because they're, they have a certain uh, aura about them or whatever, whatever you want to call it. Might be um, charisma, and that, that brings in the money. It's, it's true in every, every, every even probably back then. I, I think, yes, I think that's one I mean, one people factor. are just coming up with whatever they want to come up with to attract the students who are to attract and get the dollars in the pocket. Okay, that's, that's one see. factor. Let me propose another one. Okay. Uh, another one is that my beliefs when I was eight years old and baptized are different than my, my beliefs when I was 13. My beliefs at 13 are quite different than when I went to college and explore, explore more of the world and, and, you know, quite different. My beliefs are different today than even back in college. So the point I'm trying to make is we're all in a maturing process. We're all learning. And that causes that. I think that means that people may be attracted to different quote, churches at different points in their lives based on what their needs are at that point in time. So I'm, I wouldn't attribute all the splits to, to uh, the money. In fact, Joseph Smith, why did he break off? He, he didn't think any of the churches that date, at that time in the 1800s, represented the true will of God. And so he started exploring and went off on a different path. So I, I think there are multiple uh, causes for all the, the division. Uh, part of it is political, part of it's monetary, part of it is simply a maturing process of people at different times uh, in different stages. Well, and the different founders 
of the different, you know, the Baptist, well, you have Calvin, you have Martin Luther, you have a lot of these people who felt that they were taking the right path yeah. when they established their views. I mean, Martin Luther wasn't particularly looking to be not a Catholic, but yeah, exactly. he was upset with some of the the selling of indulgence. Indulgence, yeah. yes, thank you. Well, I think also tradition has a lot to do with it. You know, the traditions of, of your particular uh, heritage or your background with your own uh, um, not race, but race as well, but, you know, whatever your just family background yeah. is, you know, you have traditions from grandpa and grand, you know, generations back, but, you know, some people are reluctant to make any change away from that, where um, they could be ostracized from their families. And then there are cultural differences. Right. That's what I was trying to um, what I was trying to get. I mean, I was just reading. Okay, so I, my class starts tomorrow, but I've had a lot of reading to do. So yesterday I was reading about some of the liberation. The, I was reading from the uh, Black Liberation. And the guy who was writing it, I can't remember his name, was really upset with all the white theologians because they looked at it differently than the blacks, who most of them at that time were enslaved. Their view of Christianity was more present, was saying they didn't have the opportunity to have the philosophies and the you know, to sit down and think and have discussions because they were working from sun up to sun down. And so their religion dealt more with freedom and uh, taking away the suffering. And so they looked at the Bible stories more, not literally that they happened, but literally as to being saved from enslavement. Again, there I think there are multiple why there are multiple churches, and I am not personally so convinced that that's a bad thing. Now, uh, if if the pastor is simply in it for the money, that's that's different. But I think that people are attracted. Some people are attracted to music. Some people are attracted to the message. We talked about you know we are basically a community church or a family church. So we are uh, because most of our people are they. In some way, by, by family. And that's not so bad either. And I'm not sure God frowns on any of these unless it's the Charleston trying to make money. So, the money that? changers in the temple. Yes, right. <laughs> um, yeah, John? I'm just getting the general justice lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons that Christ did so much in peril is because he wanted to place things in the perspective that each of us could use our own identity and do confirmation, if we would, and say, yeah, I can see how that applies to what I know. This is what maybe my dad taught me or my family taught me, or maybe this has been my experience. Mm -hmm. Most of my ministry as an evangelist is first person. We've shared that. But then I think those... Maybe I didn't feel adequate enough and God promised me he'd do that if I loved these people. And he's never broken that promise. But I found as I've talked to one person and God shares with him. Well, for example, I, I know a really brilliant engineer who had all kinds of problems. And, and using my mouth, God talked to him and managed even as a nuclear engineer was way past me. <laughs> but it came from directions that this man understood. Then I talked to other people that were basically almost illiterate. And God spoke to them in a different way. So when he says, you know, that it wouldn't be necessary for Christ to come, that's not all true. Because Christ came so we could each grow and develop and further understand what little bit we know. 
in the hope so once we grew into it and we got to see more, we would see that we're actually growing closer together. And, and you see that today, churches today are not as divisive, not as rigidly divisive as they used to be. We're finding more and more times we have things in common with other people. They just call it a different thing. Instead of confirmation, you know, coming at a different point or coming right after baptism in certain churches, well, when you become at a certain age, which is the same thing as, as our age, you know, the accountability and stuff like that, they just use different terminology and, and their confirmational thing makes them approach and as a psychologist, the confirmational thing helps us approach things in which we're better versed. And so if we see something that's close to what we believe, we're more inclined to read that again. If we see something that's totally against what we believe, we're a little more cynical, and sometimes we don't want to read it at all. And, and I think that's where the Spirit acts with each of us individually. He takes us where we are. And what we know and understand, he says, now let me take you to the next step. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. But I think that speaks to how God really tries tries to reach us where we are. Yeah. Uh, and that's why we got for gospel. Because each of those addressed a slightly different audience. Uh, because God was trying to reach out to people in different ways. So, um, and gonna, an important thing there, too, to always remember is God loves us where we are. Yeah. You know, it doesn't make any difference how big a sinner you are. It doesn't make any difference how many times you've done that stuff. He still loves it. That doesn't mean, you know, he doesn't want to work with you and you have to be accountable. But that doesn't affect the amount of love that he has for you and his desire to see you overcome that. Well, the next question I want to pose to you is, do individual ideas about the nature of God deny the utter uniqueness of Jesus? Does viewing Jesus as human diminish his, his message? I'm going to let you just ponder that while we move on because yeah. we've got quite a bit to hit. I just wanted to say a yeah. couple of things if you don't mind. Sure. But it, it, this is sort of back to the arrangement. Uh, it seems to me that at the time he was around, that Gnostics and others, I guess, they were kind of fracturing the, the religion. It was sort of like a herd of cats. And he was trying to unify it. Now, as very often happens, he probably tried to unify it too much. And that's where a lot of the criticism that we might have of, you know, come about. But what he was trying to do is also deserves a lot of criticism. So, yeah. And anyway, I, that's sort of in defense of a range, although. Thank you. Too far. Well, I'm, I'm going to move on from here because the bottom line is um, what this chapter is trying to do is prepare us for a constant and, uh, and unify, a unified uh, Catholic church or universal church. Uh, Irenaeus was the one who was behind that consolidation. But then we get uh, all these heretics, what we call heretics, many of whom were basically church fathers who at some point in time were de declared heretics. And they were part of the, the mainstream in the sense, and then were ostracized for, for their beliefs because it was a little bit off to the side of what, uh, what Irenaeus and, and others wanted. So the heretics asked the question, what is wrong with he used as if he were simply one of us? And they also say, haven't we all been created in the image of God? Because it comes from the phrase, you know, the only begotten Son of God. Well, are we not all begotten of God? Are we sons and daughters of God? And so the heretics are saying, um, well, the Gnostics specifically are saying, look, I can, I can, 
relate to God in whatever way I think is appropriate. And I don't have to follow exactly the quote orthodox view. So move on a little bit. Irenaeus responds that although by nature we belong to the all powerful God, the devil whom Irenaeus called the, the apostasy captured and came to dominate the human race and alienate us from God. So in other words, this is that whole concept of sin, others, a, a powerful creature, force out there, devil, Satan, whatever you want to call him, who has drawn us away uh, from from uh, the true, true God. And so the question is, what's apostasy? You know what apostasy is? Because he says, Irene is called the devil, the apostasy. What is apostasy? Going away from God. Very close, very close. Is it a falling away, a withdrawal or abandonment of Christianity? Hmm. Okay. So, what he's saying is, if you don't believe what I believe, you're withdrawing from Christianity. You're in apostasy. There's no one, no other way we could have learned about God unless our master, meaning God and Jesus, existed as as the word and had become man. And the word is a key phrase here because if you look at John, if God equals the word, the word is with God and Jesus is God, is, is the word, therefore Jesus is God. So I guess there's a lot going on here. But um, what do we, you know, what do we in community of Christ believe about salvation and about the atonement? Many Christians believe that Jesus died so that we um, could be saved from sin as, as uh, kind of a sacrificial atonement. Um, I've heard many different interpretations within the church. Um, sometimes we tiptoe around it, but, you know, had God or had Jesus not um, had any ministry up until the crucifixion, would he still have been necessary, you know? And um, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure how we want, if you want to respond to that, but um, it sounds like Irenaeus is saying that Jesus conquered Satan through the act of the crucifixion and resurrection. Um, that, that's correct. And that's, yeah. a, that's a, a classical Christian belief. Yeah. yeah. That Jesus came and died for us as the Son of God. However, pardon? I remember learning that at this church. Yeah. However, there is another point of view, not necessarily with the speed from the church, which is Jesus was a prophet, Jesus was a, a teacher. And he came to teach, not necessarily die for human sins. Then you get into the whole discussion for original sin. We're really born sinful, or are we not? And if we're not born sinful, then why did Jesus die for our sins? So that's beyond what we're going to settle today. <laughs> well, but I'll uh, be happy to hear comments if you want to make out. I mean, as I as for do do we come out of the womb sinful? I'm not sure I go with that, but it's just like a, a brand new white Ferrari going through the back roads, you know, we get dirty pretty fast. So sin we find sin very easily. Well and I kind of was under the impression that we did not believe in a virgin sin that if this church did not believe in a virgin sin that. Yes, we we find it as we grow up in our understanding of what's right and wrong changes. I guess I guess if you believe in original sin, does that mean um, that an infant before they're baptized can go to hell? That was my and understanding. Also believe that. And some yeah. churches do believe that. Yeah. And it's not. yeah. I 
I, hey, Jonathan, I couldn't hear what whoever was speaking said. Um, Dorothy was saying that that's why some uh, churches, I, I believe you're talking about the Catholic Church, yeah. uh, the priest will, uh, if, a, if a woman has a miscarriage, they will baptize the baby uh, so that it wouldn't go to hell. Before it was born. Before it was born. In other words, you know, it was mis it was miscarried before you know full birth. Our church has never never believed that that was essential. Yeah. In fact, we when do we baptize children? Hey, you have a blessing too. Maybe blessing. Yeah. So maybe, maybe that's, blessing. The, that's the thing that screws it all over God. Yeah. Uh, I always thought that was just. Presenting That's the child the to God and, and saying, "Here is this child, please, you know, if you care that, for him, care for him." Because at age eight, it was believed that you had some basic knowledge of right, right, and so you were right. accountable for what you understood right. at that time. There's so, varying degrees of right and wrong. Well, but I mean, you had a basic knowledge of what was right. Yeah, knew that to hit other people other kids or other people was wrong. You knew that it was wrong to take something that wasn't yours. Yeah. Although there, <laughs> there are some eight-year-olds that we haven't learned that. Well, that's <laughs> true. I mean... <laughs> yeah, it varies with the kids. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean... Parents. They yeah. raise the kids. Back to Steve's comment about the baby blessing. If you listen to most baby blessings, they basically in some way refer to the community as being supportive of that child as they grow up. I don't think it's meant to be like an infant baptism. Yeah. Kind of thing. It's meant more to say, hey, we're, we're here for the parents, we're here for the child. And help where, where we can. Some churches call it a dedication instead of a blessing. Okay. I, I was unaware of that. That's, that's <laughs> the Dallas Rain Church does. Okay. Um, I'm going to move along. Oh, we'll not <laughs> We're not going to get through this, even the first half of this chapter, but uh, we, with all of Irenaeus's concerns, the, the solution for him was we safeguard the essential gospel message uh, upon which all must believe for salvation. Okay. And uh, of all the gospel circulating, and keep in mind, there's a secret gospel of John, there's a secret gospel of Mary, there's a secret gospel of this and that. Uh, all, you know, we, we talk about the four gospels, but at that time, there were many, many, many gospels. In fact, I think Paul brought a copy of a thick book that had all yeah. of them, and I brought one the following Sunday with all the uh, Gnostic gospels, all the secret gospels. Uh, and of all those, Irenaeus' solution is that there's a four-formed gospel. And we could go spend a lot of time going into why there are four, but the four corners of the earth, you know, four elements, you know, what, fire, wind, water, earth, earth, yeah, those are four. Uh, so four was kind of a magic number. So to him, there were four. And, and of those, he believed John was the greatest. Uh, Christians in later generations called that the New Testament canon, uh, or at least part of the canon of the New Testament. I, Irenaeus never used that term, canon. It came in in the beginning later on. And just for, I'm going to whip through this fast rather than ask you to define it. I'm just going to let you know that uh, it's based on a uh, Hebrew Greek word that said uh, basically measuring rod. So, in other words, that's how you measure the, the equivalency is in parallels. That's how you measure your faith. The rule of faith, the, the norm, following the canon of scripture. And the church fathers of the fourth century first employed that term in reference to what they called the definitive uh, scriptures of Christianity. And by that point in time, it did include the letters of Paul, the four gospels. It's, Okay. So that's just a little side note. And the books of the Bible officially accepted it as the Holy Scripture are defined as the canon of that post 
thank you. So, part of what um, Hegel's is trying to do is say to us, in between the life of Christ and Constantine, that there were many Gnostic groups, and she tries to paint this picture of the diversity. And what's interesting is, even though uh, Irenaeus believed that uh, John was the most important of all the Gospels, uh, Valentius, who is a Gnostic, quoted extensively from him. Um, Polycarp never mentions it. I love that name. Uh, Ignatius never mentions it. Uh, Justin Martyr uh, admired uh, Irenaeus. Oh, he was admired by uh, Irenaeus, uh, but never mentioned it. So these are early, what are called early church fathers, and yet most of them never mention the Gospel of John. And the Roman teacher Gaius claimed it was heretical. Uh, claimed it was written by uh, Serenthus and not John. So you have all this going on at the same time. Uh, some saying this is this is heretical. Some saying this is the primary gospel, and others not even talking about. It. So I think Hegel is to give us a sense of the the diversity of Christianity at that point. And we talked about rabbit holes before, so uh, I wanted to go down this rabbit hole just for a second because I think it's important to understand some of the differences between the Gnostics and the Orthodox Christians. Uh, Corinthus uh, believed there were two gods, an Old Testament God, Yahweh, and the God of Jesus, the Father, and uh, that was believed by many of the other Gnostics and uh, Marsha also. So there's two gods. One of the Old Testament, basically one of the new, the one of the New Testament is the Father, the one that relates to us uh, more personally. Uh, uh, Serenthus also believed that uh, Jesus was possessed of Jesus the man. The divine Jesus was, was in Jesus the man from baptism <coughs> and departed on the cross. And that the, the human Jesus was not born of a virgin, but a mere man, biological child of Mary and Joseph. We're getting a little variety. Right. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, All right. and obviously you can see where that was not the accepted Orthodox view, but it was a view of, of the Gnostics, of many of them, and even the Gnostics specifically. Yeah. Um, only, uh, by the way, Serenthus is, is only mentioned by uh, Irenae, Irenaeus uh, in his Against Paris' book. And uh, a so, very unbiased source, right? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> and um, only his theological importance. In other words, we don't have a, any of his writing, per se. We only have a of, of Well, unless what his name was right, he actually wrote John. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's true, too. That's true, too. Uh, I'm not you know, saying that's true. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, another one is uh, Tatian, who was called the Syrian and also was a Gnostic. And he was a student of Justin Martyr. And what's interesting is, again, we're trying to fill in this variety of believers in you know, the first second, second century. Um, he was a student of Justin Martyr. And he escaped martyrdom. He was a student with him, and yet many, most of the students of Justin Martyr were martyred. But Patient didn't, wasn't. So we have to ask, how did Patient escape that? He was dissatisfied with the uh, contradictions and tensions in the four Gospels, and uh, came up with this diatessaron. It reminds me of something else, like the Bible, but diatessaron. <laughs> uh, and it's based, based on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some people say it's not based on Mark, just on the other three. But the only thing that survives are fragments. And but what's interesting is, even though there are only fragments that remain, um, the Eastern churches in Syria uh, in, into the 5th century use that to read from. Well, why, 
Why did they read from it? Well, because it was a compilation of all the gospel. And we will go into Clips, his yes. view about uh, <laughs> marital sex as being fornication. He was basically a, a belief in celibacy. And here, I just wanted to show you briefly this little bit. That diatessaron, I know that's hard to read, but what it was is, and this is just one of the English language versions, is he took all of the events in the life of Christ and put them in what he believed was chronological. And so you can see it starts out with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and God is the word. That this was in the beginning with God, everything by his hand, and without him, not even one ex existing thing was made. And go down a couple of verses, and then it all of a sudden jumps to Luke. There was in the days of Herod the king, a priest whose name was Zacharias, and etc. So hmm. he literally pieced all the four Gospels together in people's chronological order, omitting a few inconsistencies, although I can't find any. Hegel says he omitted some inconsistencies, but I can't find anybody else who tells me what those inconsistencies are. Um, but it, I just thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah. And he came up with uh, this divine equation that God is in the beginning. The word, meaning Jesus, was with God. God is the word. Therefore, if Ron Miller was here, he'd say that's a mathematical equation that says God, the Father, equals the word, equals Jesus, the Son. So the Son is the same as the Father, etc. And we're out of time. So I'm gonna, was the person that wrote that whole, that whole like, chronological? Uh, Tasha. Tasha. Yeah. yeah. And you can you can go online and look for uh, the Diatessaron, and you can actually download a copy. There are several copies in PDF form that you can download. And I didn't have time in the last week or two to go through and see what the instance is. So, yeah. that's why. Well, okay. Very good. So next Sunday, uh, I think it's Paul. We'll let him know where we ended up. Hmm. And uh, good luck to him. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. You bet.